welcome ladies and gentlemen to today's tutorial uh, today we want to look at some real-time sections as regards you know epithelial and connective tissues now this is our first specimen our specimen a and we have some questions to that effect now it says which of the following is not true about the figure above now remember that this is a connective tissue because we are going to have large intercellular spaces if you can see on your screen you have large intercellular spaces over here now you can see these cells now these cells are you know somewhat stale shaped and they represent you know the mesenchymal cells now once you are seeing this you know with large ground substance then it should tell you that it's an embryonic connective tissue Remember that embryonic connective tissue, we are going to have the mesenchymal connective tissue. And then, of course, we are also going to have what we call mucous connective tissue. So let's go through what we have. Remember that you see the fibers, you can't really even see it, but you can see a lot of these ground substance over here. So the first thing says, it is an embryonic connective tissue, although morphologically appears loose. Yes, of course, because we are going to have a lot of these ground substance. Yes, even the fibers, you know, it's very difficult for you to see. Now, remember that in classification of connective tissue as loose or dense, what happens is that we lose the proportion of the fibers to cells and as well as, you know, the ground substance. Now, you can see we have a lot of ground substance here. We have a lot of cells, but even cell fibers, you know, very hard to find. Therefore, morphologically, it will appear loose. Now it says, the B says, it can be found in the umbilical cord. Yes, if it is mucous connective tissue or mucoid connective tissue, you are going to find it in the umbilical cord. You know, some authors will say it's exclusive to the umbilical cord. But recently, some findings are telling us that even the nucleus pulposus of the intervertebral disc, yes, even as well as, you know, the vitreous humor, and even the pulp of the open tooth also have some mucous, you know, connective tissue. Now, the third option is that it is capable of giving rise to other adult forms of connective tissue. Yes, in fact, that is actually classical of this type of embryonic connective tissue. You know, when it is, you know, mesenchymal connective tissue, it's going to give rise to, you know, all the adult, you know, connective tissue types. Now, the next point is that the stellish cells seen are fibroblasts with less developed fibers in the extracellular matrix. Now, yes, the fibers are less developed in the extracellular mat matrix. That is very true. Only that you are going to find that these stellate shaped cells are actually mesenchymal cells. They are not developed to become fibroblasts. So this is going to be the wrong answer in here. All right, so let's go to the next question. That's a specimen B that we are having your slide. Now, the specimen B, the questions are as follows. You know which of the following is false about that specimen now it says it is now remember that you are seeing this kind of cell this large cell over here you can see it on the screen with this large cytoplasm actually this area is supposed to be filled by what you call you know lobule of fat lobule of fat now once you are seeing abundance of these kind of cells then of course it tells you that that tissue is going to be what we call adipose connective tissue adipose connective tissue so let's look at you know the questions that we have now it is vascular with conspicuous you know adipocytes that's likely to be an adipose tissue so that is very true yes you can see the blood vessels within it you can see some you know red blood cells in there so this is actually you know adipose tissue is likely now the ne next option is that it is a site for fuel storage yes it's going to store fats which you know will be released you know will be broken down you know to generate energy you know when the need arises a source of fuel now the next point is that say tissues are endowed in the breasts you know and the gluteal regions of course you know areas where you're going to have adipose tissue yes you are going to find it in the breast even the gluteal region Yes, in the periocular region around the eyeball, yes, around the kidneys, you are going to find all these. In fact, in the, you know, greater omentum, you are going to find these kind of, under the skin, the hypodermis of the skin, you are going to find what we call, you know, I mean, adipose connective tissue. Now, the option D is that it is essential for non-shivering thermogenesis. So, generation of heat, which can occur, you know, I mean, during cold conditions, I mean, 
we are looking at a non chevron type of you know heat production it is not by the function of this tissue now remember that this kind of tissue because you are going to have a single large droplet of fat it is going to be a unilocular you know adipose tissue now when it is unilocular adipose tissue it is going to have less mitochondria and therefore you know it's not going to be you know involved in non chevron thermogenesis it's the brown adipose tissue which will be you know important as far as non chevron thermogenesis is concerned now let's go to our specimen C. Now specimen C is showing us a cell. Uh, this time around, we have to take a closer look at it. Now this cell, having this eccentric shaped, you know, nucleus with the large cytoplasm over here. Now what you find is that, you know, the nucleus is having, you know, some granules within it, forming, you know, a clock shape appearance. Once you are seeing this, then it is what we call plasma cell plasma cell. Remember that plasma cell will develop from what we call B lymphocytes. Now, let's look at the question. The question says, choose the wrong statement in the following options. A. As a result of the clock phase of the nuclei, the cells are likely, you know, the plasma cells. Of course, that is what we are going to find. The next point is that the cells are resident cells of, you know, the connective tissue. Are resident cells of the connective tissue. Yes, you know, it could be resident, but sometimes, you know, it's going to develop from, you know, come to arise from, you know, I mean, the bone marrow. Therefore, you know, it comes into the blood, eventually gets there. So sometimes we can even say it's not going to be resident. It's going to be, you know, I mean, a wandering cell. And the next point says that the cells are very important in the adaptive immune system. Yes, the adaptive immune system is very important as far as, you know, the antibodies, you know, fighting specific, you know, antigens are concerned. So it's going to produce, you know, immunoglobulins or antibodies which are going to help fight specific infections. So it's very important in the adaptive immune system. Now, the next point says that interaction with Ig immunoglobulin E will cause it degranulation and it is derived from the rarest leukocyte. It's not true. The rarest leukocyte that we find in the human body is going to be the basophil. Now, the basophil is not yes usually we interact with you know ige so that yeah there will be degranulation of it releasing you know histamine to mediate immune you know reactions but it's not going to be so here now lymphocyte b lymphocytes and for that matter plasma cells are not going to interact with ige you know immunoglobulins now the next section that we find is specimen d which is showing us some you know cells some fibroblasts with their nuclei with some collagenic fibers as well. Now remember, look at the way you know these cells are running in a particular fashion. Now look at the nature, look at the amorphous ground substance that we are having in there is sparse compared to you know the collagenic fibers that you find. Even the cells we have you know less number of cells compared to the fibers. So it tells you that this is going to be a dense type of connective tissue. But look at even the nature, how the, you know, fibers are running, you know, parallel to one another. Then it tells you it's going to be, you know, a dense type of connective tissue. It's going to be regular. All right. So we see that we, let's consider the following statement. Now, the collagenous fibers are densely packed and parallel to one another with little amorphous ground substance. That's very true. So that is one point. Now, this type of tissue or this tissue type is seen in tendons and upper neurosis of course there's dense regular connective tissue even apart from this we are also going to find some in the ligament in the ligament now the collagenous fibers are mainly of the type 1 collagen yes we talked about you know the type 1 collagen being the commonest type of collagen so we are going to find it mainly in the connective tissue proper you know the dense connective tissue and for that matter the dense regular connective tissue now the option D says the extracellular matrix is produced by the fibroblast become fibrocytes after being entrapped in the matrix having prominent cytoplasmic processes. Now remember that this option D yes partly is correct partly wrong because yes of course the extracellular matrix will be produced by fibroblast they will get entrapped within it to become fibrocytes but what happens is that these fibrocytes all have less prominent cytoplasmic processes as well as you know protein synthesis you know machinery as far as these organelles are concerned so that makes it you know wrong now if you look at specimen e specimen e you can see that there is yes sparse ground substance the cells are also fewer 
but you can see we have a lot of fibers which are running in different you know you know i mean directions a lot of fibers running in different directions so it tells you that there's going to be dense tissue but when the fibers running in different directions you know it tells you that it's going to be dense irregular collagenous connective tissue remember that there's no need of you know telling us that it's collagenous because normally we expect that for these things they are going to be you know collagen if it's of a different cell fiber then we want to emphasize that emphasize that now let's look at the questions. Now it says this connective tissue presents with more fibers than cells, hence likely to be dense. Of course, it's true, it's going to be dense. This connective tissue type is found in the hypodermis, is found in the periosteum, perichondrum, submucosa of the GIT, and the tunica, you know, abuginia of the testes. Yes, it's going to be found in all these aforementioned areas. Only that is, I mean, it's not going to be found in the hypodermis. Remember that the hypodermis is actually a subcutaneous tissue. It's going to be fat. Now, the next one says the fibers are oriented in different planes and thus permit the organ to resist excessive stretching and distension in several directions. Of course, because it's going to be, you know, densely regular, it's able to resist stress in several directions. Now, the next point is that it is an important component of most solid organs by way of capsule. Yes, it's going to be true. So capsules are also going to have dense, you know, irregular type of connective tissue. Now, with specimen F, now we find this kind of tissue. You can see there are some yellowish area. It's a fresh section. Now, these fibers are actually, you know, elastic fibers. You can see sparse ground substance in there. You know, but these fibers are actually, you know, running, you know, in several planes. And this is actually dense, you know, elastic connective tissue. Dense elastic connective tissue. So let's see what we have. Now, it says that it is a dense connective tissue type and most likely a fresh section. Now, if it's a fresh section, then it's going to have, you know, that kind of yellowish appearance. So once you find that, then you know it is dense elastic connective tissue. Now, this issue allows for recoil of structures after being stretched uh, to their original length. Yes, you know, elastic, you know, I mean, fibers have the property of recoil. Therefore, they're able to return back to their original, you know, position. Now, it can be seen in the tunica media of conducting, you know, arteries and thus form the framework for filtration of material. Now, this statement is partly true and partly false because, yes, we are going to find it in the tunica media of you know conducting our elastic arteries but only that you know it's not going to form the framework for filtration no it's actually mainly for recoil eight fibers consist of proteins namely elastin elaulin and oxytalan yes apart from elastin being the protein yes elaulin as well as oxytalan also you know play a role in this kind of you know fibers elastic fibers now specimen f is showing us you know, this is actually going to be the cartilage. This is what we call hyaline cartilage with cells lying in lacuni. So these are, you know, the chondrocytes. Remember that the chondrocytes will originally be chondroblasts. And after secreting, you know, the extracellular matrix will get entrapped in their own secreted lacuni and become what we call osteochondrocytes. Now, what we find is that there is this area which is a bit dark. And that is the territorial matrix, the newly formed matrix, is quite basophilic compared to the interterritorial, you know, matrices, you know. And of course, you are going to find that the cells are going to be in threes, in twos, or even in four or fives. And this is what we call, I mean, isogenous groups or cell nests. And once you are finding this, then you know that it is, you know, exclusive to what we call, you know, I mean, hyaline cadre. Now remember that the, you know, the ground substance, you know, over here you know it's going to be you know featureless yes we said that the fibers which are over there type 2 as well as the few other types you know types as type you know 9 type 10 and type 11 they are going to be less you know type 2 is going to have almost the same refractive index as that of the ground substance so you don't tend to see the fibers so let's see now it says that all the following are true concerning the above except now, it can be found in the trachea, nose, and forms most of the fetal skeleton. That is very true. We find it in these areas. It presents with cell nests or isogenous groups having a territorial matrix to be highly basophilic. So that's what we said. A territorial matrix is going to be highly basophilic.
Remember that that's the commonest type of you know hyaline cartilage that cartilage that you are going to find in the human body. Now it serves as model for endochondral ossification of long bones. Yes, it's very true. Now we go through some, you know, we look at the histology of bones. We look at the formation of, uh, you know, bones by way of endochondral means or intramembranous, you know, type. Now the next one is saying that the cells lying in the lacunae are chondroblasts and chondroclasts. No, the cells that you are going to find in the lacunae will be chondrocytes because they are the newly formed, you know, uh, I mean, matrix. Once they synthesize, they're going to be chondroblasts. Yes, you know, chondroclasts are actually going to be, you know, the macrophages of, you know, the cartilage. Now, the next one, we are having specimen G. We are having this kind of, you know, regularly arranged fibers. Remember that the fibers we are going to find here will be the type 1 as well as even the type 2. But mainly you are going to find the type 1 because type 2 have almost the same, you know, I mean, the same kind of you know refractiveness as that of the ground substance now what we find here will be what we call i mean the lacuni which is going to house these chondrocytes now remember that there's very you know there's linear arrangement of these chondrocytes lying in their lacuni i mean and it tends to have this kind of you know similar you know architecture to that of we find for the dense regular connective tissue so the only differentiating factor is that you find it in lying in lacunae. You have to take closer look at them. So let's look at the questions that we have under this. Now it says that there's a type of cartilage having linearly, you know, arranged chondrocytes, and it is the least common type. Yes, this is the least common type of you know cartilage that you are going to find in the human body. Yes, hyaline being the most predominant, followed by the elastic. Yeah. Now apart from the menisci of the knee. It can also be found in the pinna as well as, you know, the TFCC, that triangular fibrocarlaginous complex, that's the articular disc of the wrist joint. Now, remember that, yes, you are going to find it in the medial side of the knee, but you are not going to find the pinna. In the pinna, you are going to find actually the elastic, you know, cartilage. With triangular fibrocarlaginous complex, of course, it's going to be fibrocarlaginous. Now, it has both type 1 and type 2 collagenous fibers in its extracellular matrix. That's true. That's why we said that, you know, the proportion of the type 1 and type 2 will help you identify it. For instance, we gave an example, you know, that if you take the intervertebral disc, there's equal proportion of type 1 and type 2 collagenous fibers. Now, the next point that we find is that the presence of the chondrocytes being surrounded by a matrix or lacunae you know, differentiate it from dense regular connectivity. That's the only, you know, differentiating factor that we are going to help you in identify this. Now, this is specimen H, and this specimen H is actually showing us, you know, also one of the cartilages. So you can see the cartilages are in the lacunae. Yes, they could be singly placed or in pairs, as we explained, you know. And these ones, we are having the osteo osteo I mean, chondrocytes lying within them. But only that you find these fibers, these fibers are actually elastic fibers. Now we said that elastic fibers are the hematoxin and eosin staining. You are not going to really see it very well. Therefore, you have to use osin. You use a special elastin stain which will help us in seeing this. Now remember that we also said that, you know, elastic colleges as well as, you know, I mean, halin college are going to have what we call perichondrum. Perichondrum, because these cartilages are actually, you know, they lack what we call, you know, blood vessels. Therefore, they have to be nourished by way of perichondrum, which by way of diffusion will get to the cells. So mainly, this is what we are going to find. We are going to find these, you know, scattering, you know, I mean, randomly placed, you know, fibers, elastic fibers in the extracellular matrix. So let's find out the question that we have. Now, this type of connective tissue is endowed with perichondrum. Since it is avascular, that is very true. This connective tissue type confers strength and elasticity to organs. That is very true. It confers, you know, strength as well as, you know, elasticity to organs. Now, under hematoxin and eosin, the fibers are not clearly seen. Thus, for better visualization, osin stain is used. That is very true, as we've already talked about. It is distributed in the epiglottis, the coniculate, quiniform, and the base of the arytenoid cartilages of the larynx. Remember, this one is partly true and partly false. Yes, these areas are there, but in the arytenoid, it is actually located in the apex of the arytenoid cartilages. Um, for the base, you are going to find, you know, the hyaline cartilage. 
Now, if you have a question and they don't specify which area, whether the base or the apex, then please go with Harleen College as far as the original college is concerned. Now, the next one, which I will look at it later, this is the micrograph of it. This is actually showing the bone tissue. This is actually, you know, compact bone. And compact bone, yes, you are going to find this Habesian system, which we call it osteons. Remember that this is not osteoid. Osteoid is actually the organic component of bone, which we will look at. We explained that these are the osteons, osteoid, osteon, or the Habesian system, having this canal, Habesian canal. And remember that you have the concentric, you know, arranged lamellae. And within them, we are going to have these, you know, lacunae, which within them will be the, I mean, osteocyte. Remember that if you take a, talk about the bone, the bone will have four main cell types. You have the osteogenic or osteoprogenital cells, which will eventually become osteoblasts, which will secrete the matrix, become entrapped within it, become an osteocyte. And then we also have what you call osteoclast. Now, osteoclast will lie in a special lacunae known as houses, you know, lacunae. And what happens is that osteoclasts are actually coming from different cell lines, which are actually coming from monocytes. You know, you have about 5 to about 50, you know, fused monocytes forming what you call osteoclasts. Now, you may also have interstitial lamina as well, you know, also there. And, you know, adjacent, you know, I mean, uh, Habesian canals will be connected by way of what you call Volkmann's, you know, canal. So we're going to see that now. What happens is that these osteocytes, Will communicate with one another through what we call cytoplasmic processes, which run through their cana liquid which we will look at that one. So this one is actually forming cylinders of you know bones, so it's small cylinders which will be you know taken into larger cylinders. That's what we have for this compact bone. So let's look at the questions. Now it says that this demonstrates the hibernation system or ocean of compact bones whose thin sheets called la milli were developed by osteoblasts. Yes, osteoblasts are going to, you know, secrete these ones. The mature cells, known as osteocytes, are housed in lacunae with a bone macrophage, yes, which you said they are known as osteoclasts, dwelling in specialized lacunae known as houseships, you know, lacunae. Now, it demonstrates Habesian canal, which houses blood vessels, lymphatics and nerve, yes, the Habesian canal will, going to, you know, contain blood vessels, will contain lymphatics as well as nerve fibers. We will look at all those ones. Now, the structure about shows the Volkmann's canal. Now, the Volkmann's canal is not demonstrated in this structure, so that one becomes, you know, wrong. Now, this is another tissue. Now, this tissue, once you are seeing, you have several, I mean, red blood cells. We have some of these white blood cells. Yes, this is likely going to be the, I mean, the, I mean, neutrophil. There's another neutrophil here. Remember that the neutrophil, they have three up to five loops. Yeah, this is going to be most likely, you know, going to be the the monocyte having this kidney shaped, you know, uh, nucleus. Yeah, this is also likely. This is going to be most likely going to be the, I mean, eosinophil. Yes, eosinophils are here, you know, having this orange red granules. This is a small lymphocyte. So, and there are some platelets as well. So, this is actually the blood. You know, the blood, one thing that we find about the blood is that it is lacking what we call fibers. It's lacking fibers. It's a fluid which is going to, you know, help transport, you know, material. Now, let's look at, you know, the questions that we have under this. Now, its matrix lacks fibers and it is known as plasma. Yes, its matrix is going to be called plasma. That's the fluid part. Now, remember that when it gets clotted, yes, when, the, you know, the clotting factors have been exhausted, then it becomes what you call serum. Now, it consists of three main cell types, that's erythrocytes, that's red blood cell, leukocyte, white blood cells, and thrombocytes, I mean the platelet, with their stem cell being the hematocytoblast or the hematopoietic stem cell. That's of course, that's very true. The stem cell is the hematopoietic stem cell or the hemocytoblast. Now in adult humans, its volume is about 20% of the total, you know, body weight of an individual. No. It actually consists of about 8% of the total, you know, weight of an individual. So that if you take, you know, a, a 70, I mean, 70 kilogram man, then, you know, the volume will be around 5.6 liters. Now, the predominant wandering cell type is the neutrophil in adults. Remember that when you take the white blood cells, the white blood cells, you know, most of them are going to form the wandering cell types of the connective tissue. But remember that if you talk about the, Neutrophil. Neutrophil is actually, I mean, uh, the predominant cell type 
you know because we remember that mnemonic never let monkeys eat banana but of course in individual less than 15 years you are going to find lymphocytes actually being the predominant you know cell type now this is another type of connective tissue this connective tissue you can see that the fibers are running you know in different directions yes you can have you know fewer cells actually around you have a lot of ground substance yes a lot of ground now because you are having a lot of ground substance yeah it tells you that yes this is likely going to be loose yes the fibers to the ground substance will be you know greater sorry will be lesser compared to the, you know so there will be more ground substance than the fibers so this appears you know loose than what we've seen so far so let's look at this now it says there is more ground substance than fibers which is irregularly oriented which are irregular oriented yes the fibers you know run irregularly although they are loose the fibers are running irregularly the predominant cell is likely to be seen there it will be fibrocytes and perhaps some few fibroblasts yes of course if i want to find you know connective tissue proper then the predominant cell will be fibrocytes because after at the end they will they've been able to secrete you know they are you know extracellular matrix so they become entrapped to become what you call fibrocytes but of course we may see one or two fibroblasts being also present it is distributed in the lamina propria of mucous memory yes if you take the mucosa of the lamina propria actually you are going to find you know the most apical portion being the patella lining then the next one will be the connective that connective tissue actually loose connective tissue and it's of this type this type is actually areola connective tissue areola connective tissue then we're also going to find the next one says papillary and reticular layers of the dermis no we are going to find the papillary layer of the dermis but the reticular layer will be dense irregular connective tissue it surrounds blood vessels muscles and nerve fibers. that's very true yeah so that we can have you know those kind of pushing from these you know blood vessels by way of you know tunica adventitia you know muscles you know as well as nerves those ones will have it now functionally it binds and provides nourishment due to its high vascularity of course because it's going to have a lot of blood vessels going to bind as well as you know providing you know blood supply you know to them now this structure you know is quite confusing but one thing i have to understand is that the section was made transversely so that you can see you know the profile of you know the ends of these you know structure these represent actually the fibers with you know sparse ground substance so it tells you that this is going to be dense but you know the way the fibers were cut this is actually supposed to be dense regular connective tissue now let's look at the questions that we are having now it says that there is sparse i mean ground substance there's sparse ground substance not group substance the section was done in a transverse manner of course not longitudinal that's why the fibers have been dispersed i mean have been disturbed it is a dense type of connective tissue, yes, of course, and you can't find it in tendons and dermis of the skin. No, in the dermis of the skin, it will be dense irregular, but in the tendons, yes, we are going to find, so option D is a wrong answer. Now, if you go to our specimen M, now if you get on the screen, you are having these cells, yes, these ones are going to be the reticular cells, actually. Now, the fibers are dark. Now, normally under H and E staining, you are not going to see them, and therefore you have to use special staining technique, which is silver impregnation technique that you have to use so that you can see them. So, now, what you find is that you can see a lot of spaces, white spaces here that represent the ground substance. So, and you have a lot of cells with fewer, you know, fibers. Therefore, it tells you that there is going to be loose type of connective tissue, loose type of connective tissue. So, let's look at the questions that we have under it. Now, it says. This is a loose type of connective tissue since there is more cells or there are more cells and ground substance than fibers. That's very true. The fibers are of the type 3 and are agrophilic. Yes, these fibers which are known as, you know, I mean, I mean, uh, reticular fibers are the type 3, you know, collagenous fibers. So, and they are agrophilic, you know, they love silver stains. So that's why you have to use silver impregnation technique for it. Now it forms a structural framework for lymphoid organs, including lymph node and spleen. Of course, the liver, you know, we talk about the bone marrow, yes, the spleen. They are all going to be, you know, areas that you are going to find these kind of, you know, um, you know, connective tissue. Now, the fibers can be visualized well with eosin. No, not at all. With eosin, you can't see the fibers. Now, when we go to our specimen M, which actually will begin what we are talking about, the epithelial tissue. The epithelial, this is actually simple columnar epithelial tissue. Now, look at something, simple columnar epithelial tissue. Now, you look at, apically above the nuclei, 
you can see an empty space here yes in the cytoplasm this is actually supposed to be filled with mucin now this actually coming from the stomach now the stomach although yes you know a secret mucus to protect it well from the harsh nature of the hydrochloric acid secreted in the gastric juice you know what happens is that yes this one secretes mucus although it does not contain goblet cells it's able to secrete mucus and you know it's able to line you know the wall of the stomach remember that mucin when it combines with what you call uh Muc I mean water we are going to have mucus so this is simple columnar epithelial tissue we want you to know the epithelial tissue so let's look at the questions now this organ has a simple type of epithelial tissue yes because the epithelial tissues are just you know a single layer in a single layer there are no goblet cells and no clara cells. Of course, these goblet cells and clara cells, they are more with, you know, when you look at, you know, the respiratory part, you know, epithelial tissue, the respiratory epithelium, we're going to see more of them. We look at all those systemic, you know, microscopic anatomy of those systems, you look at all of them. This epithelial type can be seen in the stomach and the gallbladder. Yes, you are not going to find it. Yes, you are going to find it in the stomach. You are also going to find it in the gallbladder. But in the gallbladder, you are going to find some, you know, brush border as well. So, of course, you are going to find this type of epithelial tissue in the stomach and the gallbladder. Now, the small and large intestines have a similar architecture, only that they present with clara cells. No, the small and large intestines will have a similar architecture, but they will present with what we call goblet cells. Now, the specimen O yes it's showing us you know our you know simple this actually come from you know simple you know cuboidal epithelial tissue now you can see some secret material we explain all these and these are you know showing actually the colloid which has been produced by this you know it's actually come from a thyroid gland the simple cuboidal epithelial tissue simple cuboidal epithelial tissue. now for you to know the epithelial line you just have to look at the lumen the space there now the just the first layer that you you meet as you move away from the lumen becomes your epithelial tissue and remember that your epithelial tissue will have little mm -hmm. or no intercellular space unlike the connective tissue which will have you know a lot of large intercellular space so let's look at what we have now the epithelial tissue demonstrated is of the simple cuboidal type yes that is true in the plasma cumulative tubule of the kidney there are prominent brush border on this epithelial tissue type yes that's very true we looked at that but we said that you know you're going to be under you know electron microscope we're going to call it microvilli this bright water we call microvilli now this epithelial tissue type will be relevant in secretion and absorption in secretion and absorption yes very true simple cuboidal epithelial tissues will be relevant in secretion and absorption in the retinal testis the simple cuboidal epithelium present with numerous cilia pair cell and also microvilli yes it's going to present with yes it will be simple cuboidal epithelial tissue in the retinal testes we look at all of them but it will have a single cilium per cell but in addition we'll have microvilli yes we're going, we're going to perform the function of absorption as well as you know propulsion yes if you look at our specimen p our specimen p yes we are having the structure now remember that you know you can see these things now you can see the cell over here if you can see it this cell is actually goblet cell having this wine shape appearance this goblet cell now look at it once you are finding goblet cell then you know that that kind of epithelial tissue should be columnar epithelial tissue it cannot be stratified but it can be columnar but look at it now you can see that the nuclei appear to be at different levels yes having also you know these kind of you know cilia as well now once you are seeing this type of epithelial tissue then you know it is pseudo stratified columnar epithelial tissue so let's look at the questions that we have yes it says that although the above epithelial tissue is of the simple type it shows pseudo stratification that is true now the cells bear cilia and there are also other cell types known as goblet cells yes we've seen that too this epithelial tissue is needed for absorption for absorption now mainly this epithelial tissue what is going to do will be mainly for secretion and for proportion it's not mainly going to be performing the function of absorption because cilia is for movement now it can also be seen in the epithelial lining of most of the conducting portion of the respiratory system yes that's actually the respiratory epithelium which you are going to find you know in the trachea in the main bronchi and what have you mainly you know in the nasal cavity as well so this is the respiratory epithelial tissue now 
this is a tissue yes a very similar architecture this is actually you know from the artistic view it's supposed to be columnar epithelium pseudo stratified columnar epithelium this is the boom i mean bowman's you know gland uh this actually you know pseudo stratified columnar epithelium but this time around it's going to have what you call microvilli it's going to have microvilli well in addition it may have some you know cilia as well but you know these you know may boomian you know i mean bowman's glands with the you know secretory units being here and it's of the simple tubular you know type of you know gland but what we are interested in is the epithelial lining but because it's coming from an artistic view this is actually pseudo stratified columnar epithelial tissue and see, really we call it the olfactory epithelium now it says that there is the presence of system tacular microvilli and olfactory cilia in the surface of this epithelium yes that's very true it is of the stratified squamous non characterized epithelial type no this you can't see the stratified you can't see flattened cells the cells are not flat the cells are not flat and therefore cannot be of the you know stratified squamous type of epithelium no now the next point is that yeah this epithelial type is needed for faction yes it's very important as far as you know smelling is concerned now it may cell types are basal cells yeah there will be basal cells okay they will be supporting as well as you know or factory cells you know we look at all these respiratory you know epithelial later in our section the five supporting cells are also known as sustentacular you know cells now if you look at our next specimen our next specimen is having this kind of you know that this is actually coming from a single duct anyway but you know it's highly convoluted therefore if you cut it you know you, you tend to have several profiles you know of the lumen of the duct now if you look at this closely you can see that the cells you know they are columnar shape with their nuclei also being columnar but you know the cells appear some of them appear the nuclei appear to be at a higher level than others therefore there is actually pseudo stratified columnar epithelium but look at this now these you know surface specializations that you find here appear to be like cilia but they are very tall you know they show branching and that's what you call stereo cilia stereo cilia and once you are finding stereo cilia then mainly for absorption as well as you know perform mechanosensory you know function now let's look at you know what we have as questions now the epithelial tissue is of the pseudo stratified columnar type with stereo cilia that's very true now this epithelial tissue can be found in the duct of the epididymis yes it's very true the surface specialization is mainly for absorption that's very true the lining epithelial tissue can also be seen in the ductus epididymis of the vas sorry the ductus you know difference or the vas difference you can find it there now this are specimen s now you can find that the specimen s shows actual stratification we have several layers of cells in there but importantly the most epical you know cells are squamous they are flat therefore it tells you that it's going to be stratified squamous but there's no keratin so non keratinized epithelial tissue but look at something even if you are unable to see the most epical you know shape you know of the cells what happens is that you are going to find these you know the epithelial tissue will dip into the connective tissue area okay and that is what we mean by epithelial pecs which is exclusive to stratified squamous epithelial tissue and then the connective tissue also move into the epithelial tissue forming what you call connective tissue papillae so once you are finding this then you know it is stratified squamous i mean uh, non keratinized epithelium which usually is going to perform the function of protection yes yeah, so let's look at the questions now this epithelial tissue is stratified although the most superficial cell layers are flat yes that's very true so that's stratified yes this is not an epitheloid tissue since it presents with a free epical surface yes that's very true because for epithelial tissue yes which i've done in my sections what happens that they lack a free epical surface it can be found in the lining mucosa of the oral cavity yes that's very true so far goes vagina and the small intestine yes it's only the small intestine that you are not going to have find this for the small intestine you are going to find simple columnar epithelial tissue with goblet cells now it demonstrates as well as even you know microvilli or brush border or striated border now it demonstrates epithelial pecs and connective tissue papillae yes we've seen that already now for our specimen t this you can see a very large non-cellular layer once you are finding this, this keratin keratin is exclusive to stratified squamous epithelial tissue but of course again you can also see the epithelial pecs as well as the connective tissue papillae so even if we, this place is dark enough for you to see the shape of the cells you know it is going to be stratified squamous keratinized epithelial tissue 
So let's look at the questions we have. Now, there is a superficial non-cellular layer of keratin. That is very true. It is most likely a stratified epithelial type. That's true. Because you are, going to, you are not going to find keratin in the, I mean, the simple type of epithelial tissue. Now, it can be found in the soles of the feet, yes, palms, as well as the external skin surface of the lips. Yes, we're going to find this kind of, you know, epithelial tissue there. It demonstrates its presence signifies susceptibility to abrasions and hence it confers protection. Yes, that's very true. It's going to confer, you know, this kind of, you know, protection. So actually, all the options that we find here are actually going to be true. Now, for specimen U, now we can find this. Now, what we find here, this is actually going to be the transitional epithelial tissue. Now, this transitional epithelial tissue, epically, we are going to have some squamous cells, some cuboidal cells. So there's that kind of, you know, differences in, you know, cells. Now, this one sometimes you are going to find what you call fused form vesicles which we will look at other slide we will get to see that but you can see that you know there are some polyhedral cells now one thing that we find is that those tend to be you know bring some kind of confusion with stratified you know i mean squamous epithelial tissue therefore the only thing that you can help you to do that is that this one is lacking what you call epithelial pecs as well as connective tissue papillae this epithelial tissue is also known as you know urethelium which of course we know all those ones now so let us see the questions that we have now this epithelium is commonly referred to as lutelium yes that's very true it is specific spe specifically referred to as transitional epithelium due to its you know va varying presentation between the straight and relaxed form we said that in the relaxed form it appears the cells appear dome shaped there's peripheral cells now this epithelial tissue is impermeable to salt and water yes it's very true now, this epithelial tissue can be found in the calyx of the kidney, ureta, urinary bladder, and the urethra. Yes, the urethra part is partly wrong because, you know, when you look at the prostatic urethra or the prosmal part of the urethra, yes, it's going to be, you know, pseudostratified, sorry, it's going to be transitional epithelium. But if you look at, you know, the membranous as well as some portion of the pinary urethra, you are going to have pseudostratified columnar to stratified columnar epithelial tissue. And even the external, you know, orifice is going to be, I mean, I mean, stratified, I mean, squamous epithelial tissue. Now the next section that we are going to find here now let me just enlarge it briefly for you to see something now what we find is that if you look at it closely the epithelial tissue it tends to be like stratified squamous but not so but you can because you can see some whitest areas which represent what you call fusiform vesicles now these fusiform vesicles actually represent you know the compartment for intracellular transport of urethelial you know plaques which regulate the surface area of urethelial cells during the extension contraction cycle Yes, you know, it's going to distend and contract, you know, that's why you are going to find all these things. So once you are seeing these kind of fusiform vesicles, which are these whitest patches, then you know that this is coming from what we call, you know, transitional epithelial tissue. So let's pick out a four statement. This is a stratified epithelial tissue type. Yes, it's very true. Once you are seeing transitional epithelial stratified, it contains fusiform vesicles. It can be found in the ureter. Yes, of course. It can be found in the oesophagus. No, in the oesophagus, you are going to find what you call stratified squamous non-keratinized epithelial tissue. Now, this specimen W, you as you are finding what you call, yes, it's actually a simple type of epithelial tissue. But this time around, you are having some short cuboidal cells which are bearing what you call microvilli with long, you know, columnar cells which are bearing actually what you call micro uh, cilia. And the cilia is going to be for proportion. Microvilli are going to perform secretory function. Now, what we find is that, yes, yeah, let's look at it. There are short secreted cells known as peg or intercalate cells present. Yes, in fact, we will look at all those ones uh, later. Yes, they are there. They are the short cuboidal cells. And they are secretory in function. There are tall columnar cellular cells present. That's very true. This architecture, yes, is seen in the uterine tube. Yes, if you look at the fallopian tube, you are going to find it there. There are unicellular goblet cells. There are no goblet cells present. Now this one shows actual transition, so we can see the transition from actually stratified. You can see stratified squamous non keratinized epithelium to actually simple columnar. So if I enlarge it for you to see, we are going to find that these cells are actually simple columnar epithelial tissue. Simple columnar epithelial tissue. So once you are finding these kind of simple columnar epithelial tissue, then you know that yes, of course, uh, there's that kind of transition over there. So let's look at that. So let's look at the question that we are having. This represents the transition from a particular learning to another. Yes, that's very true. 
This can be seen the gastro, yes, osophageal junction of the alimentary canal. Yes, in the GIT, you are going to find that one there. Yes, the epithelial lining on the left hand side is protective, yes, because it's going to be stratified squamous. So, if one is a stratified squamous, in fact, if one is a stratified, it's going to perform the function of protection. The epithelial lining on the right hand side is more robust, no, it's less robust to perform the function of protection because it's simple columnar epithelium. Now, for our specimen Y, we are having this kind of epithelial tissue. Yes, it's also showing a transition. This is actually from simple columnar because we are having these goblet cells with goblet cells. There, there will be microvilli. You look at all those ones in the systemic aspect of this microscopic anatomy. And then we also are changing to what we call stratified screen because you can see these kind of epithelial pecs as well as connective tissue papillae as well. So let's look at our questions that we have under this. So we have it that there is a transition from columnar epithelial type to squamous type. Yes, that's very true. The epithelial type on the right hand side has fusiform vesicles. No, there are no fusiform vesicles. Those things that you find there are actually goblet cells. You can see those white patches over there, and they represent what you call goblet cells. Goblet cells. They are goblet cells. So, all those white areas that you find, if you take a closer look at it, they are represent what you call goblet cells. Now, the next one that we find is that the epithelial tissue on the left hand side has numerous goblet cells. That's very true. This is typical of the anorectal junction. That's very true. The transition from the you know the rectum to the anal canal. We are going to find that architecture there. So that's what we find. Now, for our last question. Now, what we are interested in is the follicular cells. Look at the follicular cells. You can see these flat shaped cells they represent the squamous you know cells therefore they have what you call squamous epithelium now so let's look at that quickly the follicular epithelial cells are of the simple squamous type that's very true they can be found in the alveoli of the lungs the alveoli of the lungs also have it yes if you look at the bowman's capsule yes you're also going to find it there if you look at the thin segment of the loop of Henley, you also find it there they are essential for diffusion and filtration. That's very true. And they may serve a protective function. No, this is a simple type of epithelial tissue. Therefore, wouldn't serve the function of protection. Ladies and gentlemen, this, you know, actually represents the real time section. We want to look at those histological aspects of the tissues. I hope it's going to be helpful in the study of, you know, tissues as far as connective tissue and epithelial tissues are concerned. In our later sections, we'll look at other tissue types and we look at all, all those ones. Thank you very much for your audience.